How's everybody doing? Good. Good, 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 good. How many uh, came last night for a regional prayer night? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Man, we had people swinging from the chandeliers last night. Oh, my. It was awesome. Awesome. And I want to just say a special thank you to our team that helped with that. Um, it was just extraordinary. So, so good. Hey, did you happen to notice something about uh, some of our leaders and how they're dressing today? I saw that uh, Charles is wearing all black. I saw that Kathy is wearing all black. I'm almost there. I think, this is, just, this is just my prophetic instinct here, I think that it's because we're, we're getting ready to mourn the fact that today might be the last day of sunshine in the Northwest for the next six months. <laughs> That's just a guess. It's just a prophetic guess. But, but anyways, I just want to throw that out there. Um, you, all, you all believe me, don't you? Go ahead and grab your notes today. Um, wasn't worship beautiful? Oh, my goodness. Can we thank the worship team? Thank the worship team. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to um, Psalm 24. It is actually our church's scripture. Psalm 24 is the scripture for our church, Jake's house. And if you didn't know that, you'll see in just a minute why that is. We've been talking about prayer. You guys love prayer? You excited about prayer? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. I'm telling you what, prayer is the ticket. It's the ticket. Wherever you want to go, it's the ticket. And so, uh, man, man, if you want to go higher, prayer's the ticket. Yeah. You want to get a breakthrough? get on the other side. You've been in a storm. You need to get on the other side. Prayer's your ticket. Come on. Amen. You need a relationship healed. Prayer's the ticket. Yeah, you need healing. Prayer's the ticket. Come on. Yeah. So we can, we could preach and teach on prayer for a long time. Yeah. Well, um, I heard Pastor Charles did an awesome job last week. Yeah. Yeah. We had a beautiful time. There was a number of us. We were over in our daughter church in Spokane for the Ricketts, which are elders, and now they're over there. But we'll, we'll, still, we'll still be seeing them. They'll still be staying in touch. So we had the Ricketts and the Mitchell, Mitchell family, and so Ryan and Isaiah. And it was one of the most beautiful weddings I've ever been at. It was absolutely extraordinary. And um, there's a number of people just talking about that. I mean, it was just the conversation. It was just so glorious. And um, I, w what was on my heart about it is I felt like it was because of all the prayer and all the labor of love that went into it. Not just into the ceremony. You know, that's just a, that's just a one-day event. But all the prayer and the labor of love that's gone into gone into their relationship and the future of their relationship and uh, it was just it was just fantastic it was so so good pastor toby and patty they send their love and their team and their church is doing so well and carmen and i we spent time with them and saturday morning we went and saw their new building that they're getting ready to move into they're building it out right now and it'll be done sometime uh late winter early spring hopefully february march and so we'll be going over there to celebrate their grand opening and, and uh, do some ministry. But, um, uh, man, it's just so exciting to see our daughter church just, just exploding with just the life of God, the presence of God. And, yeah, it's just, just beautiful. And, and Jesus is, I just, wanna, just want you to know this in case you don't, but Jesus is Lord over Spokane. He is. He is. He's king. He's king and Lord over Spokane. And it's just beautiful what's, what's going on over there. Yeah. Okay. Did you grab your notes? Did you turn to Psalm 24? Okay. Great. In your notes here, uh, look, look in the review part here. And we've talked about prayer. It, it, prayer is much, much more than a duty. 
No obligation. I have to, right? Come on, you guys got to help me preach because I'm pretty wound up today. So you, you got to grunt and groan or, you know, something. Throw something at me. Make some noise. Whatever. Okay. But, um, but prayer is so much more than that. It's, it's so much more than the religious uh, 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 mandate of bloodying your knees, you know, of spending hours, right? All that stuff. Prayer is so much more. Jesus said, that, and, and, and uh, Charles mentioned it just a moment ago. He, he said, in John 14, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. See, what prayer is, is it's, 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 a, it's a spiritual place. And when we say spiritual place, we're not talking about in our imagination or some kind of fantasy land. We're talking about it is a genuine, real, authentic place. Paul said it this way. He said, he said this, that you are made to sit in heavenly places. Heavenly places. Jesus went before us because of his life, death, and resurrection and his blood. He prepared a place for us to go in the spiritual realm. Come on, amen. This, this, so this is what prayer is. Prayer is the opportunity, whatever. And we listed a number of different types of prayers. And Charles, last week, he talked about the, the prayers of commitment that you find in the deserted place. And by the way, the deserted place is such a place of blessing. Um, Jesus anticipated, Jesus, hear this, okay, because a lot of people don't understand the, the, the temptation of Jesus in the desert. Jesus anticipated a backlash because he had just been prophesied over by John that he was the son of God, that he had the father's favor and the father's love, and that there was a calling and a destiny upon his life. So John just prophesied that in the river. Jesus knew that there was going to be a backlash again. That because the Bible says that as soon as the word is sown, the prophetic word is sown, Satan comes immediately. He does. So, yeah, it's awesome to be hungering and desiring a prophetic word, but you've got to understand once you get that word, the enemy is going to come after it. Look at what happened to life of Joseph. By the way, Psalms talks about Joseph and the word that he received and the hell that he went through after it. Okay? Because the principle is, God sows a seed, right? He sows a word, a prophetic word, and Satan comes immediately to try to take it away. So Jesus gets this incredible prophetic word that's going to launch him into ministry. I, this isn't even in my notes. This is a freebie. Glory to God. Don't you just love freebies? I love freebies. So, so, so Jesus gets this prophetic word, and uh, he knows immediately Satan's going to come for that. So what does he do? He positions himself in a place of victory. He positions himself in a place that he knows Satan's going to come after him. I need to be in my best position to win when the enemy comes. Come on. Come on. Why do you think Jesus went to the garden in the deserted place? Why do you think he said, guys... You need to stay right here. i got to go just a little bit farther and be separated from you. He, Jesus had to get in that deserted place because it was setting himself up for the victory that he needed because he knew the enemy was coming. So there's sometimes when prayer has to be in the deserted place. Sometimes prayer is in the happy place. You just jump in this prayer and space with God and it's just joy and happiness. By the way, we believe in happy intercessors around here. Come on. Sometimes prayer is in a bold place. I mean, you just step into prayer and all of a sudden it's like God grabs you by the Back, jerks you by the back of the shirt and go. <laughs> what are we taking on today, God? <laughs> you know? Sometimes you step into that place of prayer and it's just this humble place, right? It's just a sweet spot. It's just like there's just, just this rest. Prayer can. 
And this is that's what Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Prayer is not a duty. It's not an obligation. It's not a have to. It's not about hours or bloody in your knees. It's about spending time with him. So we want to we want to cultivate a place. I love, um, you know, we we started this whole series off with one of my life favorite scriptures for prayer when Elijah goes before the wicked king Ahab, and he goes, "Hey, dude," and he doesn't say, "I'm this great prophet," and say, "I'm a miracle worker," and say, "I'm this man of God." He doesn't say anything. He introduces himself to Ahab. He says, Ahab, I stand before God. So you can be the, what the world would say is the greatest, the biggest loser, the biggest failure on the planet. And man, I've stepped in that shoe, those shoes before. But everything changes when you step into that place of prayer and you stand before God. There's, there's just no greater, there's just no greater privilege. There's no greater joy, no greater privilege to say that we can come boldly before the throne. Man, think about that. The invitation is always there. It's always yes. Daddy, can I come boldly before your throne today? Yep. Well, I kind of got myself in a big mess. Can I still come boldly? Yep. Man, I really screwed this one up, Jesus. <laughs> can I come boldly before the... You sure can. You better. <laughs> you better get up here real quick. <laughs> what are you waiting for? Mm. My goodness. We talked about um, for the righteous son and daughter, prayer avails much power. For the hungry son and daughter... Secrets and mysteries are revealed. For the confident son and daughter, you can do great exploits. I mean, come on, isn't that beautiful? We talked about the power of intercession and reestablishing, restoring intercession. You know, having your hand on the throne, having your hand on that broken person or that broken place of your life or somebody else's life or, or your community or your nation and not letting go. And that's what Jesus did on the cross, Right? That cross represents a transaction or intersection between the broken and, and the heavenly, between the natural and the heavenly. And here's the cross. Come on. You understand that that, that cross was intersecting. Come on. The, the, the heavenly realms, right? And the, and, the, and the worldly realms and the demonic realms. Yeah. And that's what intercession represents. And prayer is just such a beautiful thing. Today, today... Did, it, did I cover everything I wanted to cover? No, oh no, gosh, we didn't read Psalm 24 yet. That one almost got away from us. Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's. Everybody say the earth. The earth is the Lord and all of its fullness in the world and those who dwell in, therein. For he is founded upon the seas and he is established upon the waters. So he's talking about the earth, right? Okay. Verse 3, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Now, wait a second. Oh, we were talking about the earth. We, we got schizophrenia here. What's going on? I thought, come on, I thought we were talking, that's the subject is the earth, right? And all of a sudden, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Now, wait a second. See, everybody wants to take everything in Scripture to all about heaven. One day in the sweet by and by, come on. No, 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 no. No, the subject is the earth. And prophetically, David starts going off and he says, but who may ascend then the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? Remember when, when, when Joshua was getting ready to go to battle? Yeah. Right? Joshua was getting ready to go to battle, all of a sudden Jesus shows up. Yeah. yeah. He said, Joshua, I need you to do something here because you're standing on holy ground. Remember when Moses had an encounter in the desert? And Moses, hey, I got to, you got to do something here, man. This is, and he, he has an encounter with the Lord, right? That was in the earth. That's the point. It was in the earth. 
God created a holy space, a special place for God and man to meet. Come on. Because why? Because he loves us so much, he's finding ways, creative ways to get to us. That's, that's the message of Jesus. That's the whole thing. He, God's finding ways. He's finding ways to get to us, to get to his people, to get his people are his treasure. He, they're the ones he's madly in love with, passionately in love with. And so, who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Well, not me. I'm such a screwball. Who may stand in this holy place? Definitely not me. He who has clean hands and a pure heart? Well, there. I'm completely disqualified there. Who's not lifted up his soul to an idol? Well, pff, might as well just put the coffin on that. Nor sw sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. Look at this. <laughs> Sometimes we just read Scripture, but we don't really read it. This is a Jacob generation. Now, wait a second. He just said, he just said, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. That ain't Jacob. That ain't Jacob. He was a trickster, deceiver. He, he, he was a crookster. Come on. That wasn't Jacob. Am I reading my Bible right? He says, who's going to ascend the hill of the Lord? Who's going to stand in his holy place? Listen all this stuff. And it says, this is Jacob, his generation. Those that seek the Lord who seek his face. Oh, okay. Hmm. Then verse 7, lift up your heads, O your gates, be lifted up, you everlasting doors. Why? What's that all about? That the king of glory can come. Oh, who is this king of glory? Oh, the Lord strong and mighty. Lord mighty in battle? Battle? Lift up your heads, O you gates, be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory will come. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. So that makes sense then when Jesus said in Matthew 6, he said, pray this way, my kingdom come. Oh, my kingdom come. My king come, the king come. We just read the king come. How does the king come? When you lift up your heads. Open up the doors. Hmm. Okay. Well, not getting into great depth on this, but what this is speaking of, and I relate it to all of Paul's teachings in the New Testament, but lifting up your head, the, Paul says this, set your mind, set your mind on things above. He says in, in, in Acts 14, he says this, that your heart is the door. Your heart and your spirit is the door. For the spiritual realm. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So, so when I set my mind, my soul, on the things above, where my expectation is towards him. It's kind of like when, when Peter, you know, saw Jesus walking on the water. Yeah. And he put his eyes on the Lord. Yeah. And he could walk and do the impossible as long as his eyes, as long as his eyes, his soul... Your soul, sometimes your soul will trip your spirit up. As powerful as your spirit man is, sometimes your soul can trip up your spirit. So set your mind on things above. Lift up your heads. Is your expectation towards heaven, towards the Lord? And then open up your heart. And when we do that, then his kingdom comes. His, the, the king comes. Well, obviously, David was such a prophet, he understood, well, we don't know to what degree, but I believe that he understood that, he, that this is something in the future that God was laying out when Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. 
that it wasn't just going to be once in a while, a great while, that Moses happens to stand in this holy place and has this face-to-face with God, or Joshua stands in this holy place and has to, they all have to take their sandals, sandals off and have to have this, and get to have this face-to-face encounter with God, but, but that Jesus was, was, was preparing the way for all of us. For, for Jacob, for Jake's house, for everybody, regardless of <laughs> your your own righteousness, <laughs> because your your righteousness ain't getting you to the throne. It's what Jesus did. Jesus made the way. He made the way. He is the way. He made the way for you to come boldly. Hmm. Okay. So there you go. I, I hope that clarified some things. So I woke up the other morning. Carmen and I have been fasting this month. And uh, tomorrow we leave. We go on a little trip to Mexico. For a week we had some, something planned. We, it was something we bought uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, a couple of weeks in Mexico. So we, we're going to do a, a week this, this week and then, and then a couple of weeks next year. And... Um, so I need some I need some sun on this bald head. And uh, but um, Carmen and I we've been fasting we've been fasting and encouraging you guys to fast this month and and all, by the way f- find that one day out of the week that you set aside time to pray and fast. Find find that one day out of the week it it, it will be life changing for you honestly it's just so critical it's so important and I won't spend more talking about that today. But I woke up the other morning, and typically God doesn't speak to me like this. Typically, it's just him and I. We just chill, and then we'll just have a conversation. And that's typically how the Lord speaks to me. Of course, he speaks to me through visions and dreams and encounters and different things like that. But this, and, and, and then what I'm about ready to share, I woke up, and I woke up with this word, just boom. I'm like, oh, huh, whoa, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? And... Uh, and, and the word was escalatory. In other words, escalation. And I'm like, what? It's kind of an odd word. Escalation. Okay? So, and it's just in my face. I'm like, Lord, what is this about? Escalation, escalation. And uh, so, of course, you know, I went to the Webster's and looked at it. And, you know, it's referring mainly, its main emphasis in the, why the word was constructed was because of battle. And, uh, and so, oh, this is interesting, okay. So then, you know, later on I'm doing my set devotions, and so I have set devotions. And uh, my set devotion was uh, Psalm 24, right? And then, of course, our scripture for the church, Psalm 24, is verse 6. You know, we are Jacob generation, those that seek his face. Psalm 24, 6. And then... Psalm 24, then, of course, my set read is then Proverbs 24. So I'm reading Proverbs 24, and I get to, of course, verse 6, and it says this, For by wise counsel you will wage your own war. And all of a sudden, I felt the Spirit of God. I'm like, Lord, that's why I woke up with that word this morning, escalation. I said, God, you're wanting us to go to battle. You're wanting us, there's, there's an escalation that's coming. That, and and he, he's just speaking and preparing, get ready for battle. It's going to escalate. And uh, man, the, the Spirit of the Lord was all over that. And what was wild was, is, is, of course, I had already told Pastor Angela, she helps administrate, you know, all the, all the ministry throughout the weeks and stuff like that, months. And, and she already knew that I was getting ready to preach on, on spiritual warfare. And so, here we are today preaching on warfare prayer, and uh, then, you know, then I just having all these fun encounters. So, I just thought I'd bless you with that. Well, the, the, the message of today is, for the next, you know, 20, 25 minutes here, I'm, I'm going to talk about the message today is, it's time to throw down. 
Now, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a one of those professional wrestler guys. What do they call that, the professional wrestling? What do they call that? Yeah, F, uh, W, F, W, F what? WWF, yeah, I'm not a WWF guy. I think it's kind of funny myself. I mean, you got guys wearing Speedos and throwing each other around and stuff like that, you know, but whatever. You know, I'm not judging, you know, <laughs> if people enjoy that, that's fine. But, uh, but I'm not into that, you know. But, um, but I, 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 I felt the Lord saying, man, he said, it's time to throw down. We're going to battle. It's time to throw down. And, uh, and so there's some scriptures that the Lord gave me. And um, let me, let me I, I wasn't planning on reading all these, but I think these are fun scriptures. I think, I think, I think, I think you enjoy this. Uh, Jeremiah 1. Verse 10, this, the Lord speaking, speaking to Jeremiah says, Behold, I've put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day, this is Jeremiah uh, 110. See, I've set this day, set you over nations and over kingdoms to root out and to throw down, to destroy and to throw down. I mean, come on, this is awesome. That God would, I mean, in the new King James, I mean, come on. The Lord, I mean, it wasn't the WWF that came up with this stuff. It's Jesus came up with this stuff. Uh, he said, look at this. See, I've set you over the nation. Everybody say nations. Over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, and to throw down, to build, and to plant. You know you can't properly plant until you root out. You can't properly build until you've thrown down. So that's a fun scripture, huh? Um, you want another one? <laughs> uh, Second Kings. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 33. Well, in verse 30 it says, Now when Jehu, he, he, he was anointed by Elijah. And Jehu had come to Jezreel. Uh, Jezebel is the wicked queen. She heard of it. This is Ahab's wife, Jezebel. She's wicked, wicked king or queen. Wicked. She's a, she's a witch. And she, she, put, she got herself all adorned, painted herself up, and Jeshu entered into, into the, at the gate, and, and everybody's like, oh, oh, Jehu, why are you here? And he looks up at the window, verse 32, and says, who, who is on my side? Who? And two or three of the eunuchs looked out at him. Then he said, throw her down. <laughs> So he threw her, they chucked that witch right on out the window. She, they threw her down. Okay. Well, that doesn't sound like Jesus. Oh, man, if we only knew. <laughs> but, you know, uh, in the New Testament, then, it's, it, Paul helps clarify to make sure that we're not chucking people out windows. <laughs> we don't want to do that. <laughs> right. So... Paul clarifies it in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Though I have been tempted at times to throw people out windows. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For we walk in the flesh, but we don't war according to the flesh. Oh, okay. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not worldly, not of this world, but mighty in God. For what? Pulling down strongest, for throwing things down. Casting down, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity. Oh, fighting knowledge. Mm, taking captive thoughts. Mm. No wonder people don't want to debate anymore. Mm. No wonder people don't want to have rational conversations anymore. Because it's probably demonic activity that's going on. And those demons don't want to get thrown down. Just a thought. That's a good thought. And look at this. And being ready to punish all the disobedience. Whew, 
man, glory. And again, God is not into punishing people. It doesn't say that. You've you got to read the Bible correctly. He's not talking about punishing people. Okay. He's talking about going after evil actions. Evil, because this is important. He's talking about first evil thoughts, evil words, and evil actions. Put it all in context. Okay. Does that make sense? Again, we're not chucking people out of the building. Though we've all been tempted to, that's not what Jesus wants. But he wants us to go after evil thoughts, evil words, and evil actions. That's, that's what's here right here. Okay? All right. So if we're going to go to warfare prayer, we've got to pray with authority. We've got to pray with authority. And so I've got some scriptures here. We don't have time to look at them, but if we're going to, in your notes here, if we're going to go to battle, if we're going to start throwing down, and we just gave a whole bunch of throwdown scriptures. Everybody say throw down. A bunch of whole throwdown scriptures, okay? But if we're going to go to battle, we're going to throw down, okay, and we're going to have victory, then we must know how to pray in authority. This is huge. Jesus says in Luke 7, 8, he says this, I have authority because I'm under authority, okay? I have authority because I'm under authority, Okay, and then James says it another way. He says it this way, submit, everybody say submit. I know for some of you that's a cuss word, but don't let it be. It's a beautiful word, okay? Submit, okay, submit to God, and then what? Then you can kick the devil out. It says you can resist the devil, okay? So, so th this is how we gain authority is because we're under authority, okay? So this, this, is, this is where the authority comes from. Come on, we, uh, Kathy did, didn't Kathy do a great job this morning? That was so good. I mean, gosh, that was awesome. Talking about flow, okay? So the, 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 the kingdom of heaven is all about flow, okay? It's all about flow. So, so it's flowing from Jesus, right, as the head, and he's, he, he, he's, he's, he's supreme authority, okay? And that authority is flowing down, okay? And we got to stay in that flow of authority, okay? Stay in that flow. And so... So, the, so, the, so what does that look like also? What does that look like? I listen to some scriptures here. So to, to stay and pray in authority means to follow after the laws of the Spirit. Say, what? I thought we're no, under, no, no longer under the law. No, we're not. We're not under any laws. But he has taken the laws of the Spirit and written them on our hearts. That's what the Bible says in Hebrews. It says, God took the laws of the Spirit, the kingdom, the kingdom laws. So... <clears throat> we could say this physical building represents the kingdom of God, and so we just walked in, and Jesus is sitting here on the throne. But then right at the door is this incredible, incredible, you know, placard that has the laws of his kingdom, right? So you, when you walk into the room and you walk into the place, you see his laws for his kingdom, his statutes, right, his ordinances, for his kingdom because, you know, this, this kingdom and his space and he's ruling over it. And he wants everybody to know his laws, right? Yeah? Yeah. Good. So, so that's, what, that's what went on when, when Jesus died and was resurrected, right? And then we became one with him when we said yes to him and then our spirit was joined with his spirit. Is he took his, the laws of his kingdom, the spiritual laws, and he, he wrote them on our heart. <laughs> Look, <laughs> I, I, oh man, I don't have time for this, but you, you know, um, the, the, the New Testament apostles and evangelists and pastors and elders and all the New Testament workers and stuff like that, as they launched the New Testament church, they, di they didn't have Bibles. They didn't. They didn't have Bibles. What did they have? They had the spiritual laws written on their heart. Right. Now listen, thank God for God's word, right? Yeah. I mean, we, we need the word. And, and, and of course, they had, and I won't take in the time, they found ways to get the written word and get the written word in their heart, okay? And so praise God for that, okay? It was of, of the highest essential, just like it is for us. You know, meditate on the word day and night, and you're going to have great success. But you got to understand, though, that God has written his spiritual laws on your heart. So what are some of those? Well, Romans 8, 2 uh, talks about the laws of the Spirit. 
Romans 13 talks about the law of love. If you want to pray in authority, you want to throw down in battle, you've you got to have the law of love. You, okay, you, you, you got to be walking and you got to be following. you got to be walking in the law of love. You can't have authority over demons with unforgiveness and bitterness in your heart. Come on, if you want to have authority and get traction in the spirit and start gaining ground, come on, and, and, and go places and, 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 and pull down. We read in Jeremiah to pull down, to throw down, to root up and pluck up, come on, and to plant. You're going to have to be able to walk in love, and you can because he wrote that on your heart. Romans 3.27 talks about the law of faith. The law of faith. If you're going to have authority, you've got to have the law. You can't be double-minded. You've got to know that God is true and let every man be a liar. You've got to know that his word is true. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will stand forever. You may pass away, but his word's going to continue to stand. I, you know, that's a powerful place because there are some things you are fighting for that you might not see, but your kids should. Let, let me say that again. There are some things that you might not see, but your kids should. Why? Because you have it in your heart. Heaven and earth might pass. Or uh, <laughs> everything around you in this in this earth could pass away. Okay, you could pass away, but that word that God gave you and your family is not going to. You get it? <laughs> because you say, well, why do you say that? I thought it was just for me. Not no, the whole universe doesn't revolve around you. Just, just want you to know that. You know, the Bible does say that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's a God of generations. He's not just thinking about you. He's thinking about your kids, your kids' kids, and those that come after. That's what he's thinking. And he's, he's wanting to root out, and he's wanting to plant, and he's wanting to sow the word of God in you. So it's not just for you. It's for your kids and your kids and your kids. And you've got to battle for that. And you've got to stay in the law of the Spirit. Come on. He's written those laws on your heart, and you've got to walk in authority so that word can go forward, not just for you, but for your kids. Glory. Yeah. Feel the fire of God, Jesus. Okay, here's another law. People say, oh, we're in the New Testament now. It's all about Jesus, and we're no longer under the law. You're not under the law, but listen, dingbat. There are, still, there are still laws of the Spirit that you, you have to function. If you're going to function in the kingdom, you've got to function in the kingdom laws. So here's another one. So you've got the law of love, laws of the Spirit, the law of faith. Here's one, the law of Christ. Oh, man. So many people don't know about the law of Christ. Galatians 1 and 2. Six, Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Law of Christ. You see someone broken? You want to fix them? Oh, you're fulfilling the law of Christ. <laughs> Wish I had time to get in all this. Okay, so we're talking about what it means to have authority. Having authority then to throw down in battle means that you've got to pray in, with authority. You've got to be under authority. and then, In other words, you've got to be following the laws of the king. Okay. Awesome. Okay, now go to this final spot here for these last 10 minutes. Is everybody doing okay? Okay. All right. It's not too much this morning, is it? Okay, good. 1 Samuel 14, and we'll conclude here. This is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite. I think you're going to really be blessed by this. 1 Samuel 14, this is one of my favorite Old Testament pictures, types, or shadows of prayer. Okay, this is an example or a picture or type of shadow of prayer in the Old Testament. Because Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 10. He talks about that there's types and shadows, right? Yeah. Examples. Okay. And so 1 Samuel chapter 14, I'm going to read a bunch of verses here, and we'll look at some stuff. And it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to his young man who bore his armor bearer, his, bore his armor, he was the armor bearer, come, let us go over to the Philistines. That's the enemy, the, the Philistine enemy's garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his dad. And Saul, Saul, his dad, was sitting on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is, which is by Migron. And the people who were with him were 600 men. That's very significant. 
and Abijah, the son of Ahitabah, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. That's very significant. I don't have time to get into all that. Wearing an ephod. Now, ephod was the prayer garment for the priest. Okay? Everybody say prayer. Okay, so there's a prayer garment for the priest. But look at this. So, so here's the priest. He's, he's in this place of prayer. But it says, but he doesn't, but, he, the, but the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. So he didn't know what was really going on. Verse 4. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other. And the name of that one place was Bozes, and the other place was Senna. In front of one faced northward opposite of Michmash. Don't you just love the Bible words? They're so much fun. Michmash. Is, is that from McDonald's? Anyway, so the, uh, the other is southward opposite of Gibeah. Jonathan said to his young man who bore his armor, so this is armor bearer. Everybody say armor bearer. Now, this, see, one man and prayer. Now, the, in the Old Testament, type and shadow, ar- armor bearer means prayer. Okay, so it's, it's, armor bearer represents and it's an example of prayer. So one person, Jonathan, and prayer. Okay. Now, by the way, Jonathan is the son of love. So you and I are born as Jonathan's, the son of love. And I don't know, I have time to get into all that and, and explain, but you and I, we're all Jonathan's son of love. Uh, <laughs> matter of fact, uh, okay, so anyway, I just take time to, don't have time to get into all of that. But uh, everybody say, I'm a Jonathan. Okay, so you and prayer, you and prayer can definitely go to battle. Okay, and you can definitely throw down. So this is what goes, goes on. So Jonathan, he takes his armor bearer, which represents prayer. He says, come on, let's, we're, we're going to go over to the enemy's garrison here to these uncircumcised. Everybody say uncircumcised. uncircumcised. Then it may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many for by few. Well, that's true. So the armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Oh, that's huge right there. Jonathan said, very well, let us cross over to these men and we'll show ourselves to the enemy. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? We'll show ourselves to the enemy. Just two of them, they're going to the enemy's garrison. So they say, uh, it, we'll, we'll wait, and if they come to us, and we'll just stand still in our place and wait for them to come. And he says, but if they say thus, come on up to us, because so, they're up on top of the rocks. So they say, come on up to us, then we'll go up. For the Lord has delivered them into our hand, and this will be a sign to us. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jonathan, did you, you know, kind of lo- get a screw loose or something like this? You know, was th- th- this is going to be a sign? This is going to be a sign. Okay. So if they come down to us, we'll just, we'll just be cool. And they'll come down to us. We'll fight them. But if they call us to go on up, then we'll go on up. Either way, it's going to be a sign. <laughs> Verse 11. Verse 11. So the both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines, and the Philistines said, Look, the Hebrews, the Christians, they're coming out of their holes. Look, the cute little Christians, they're coming out of their holes where they've been hidden. And, the, and then the garrison said to Jonathan and to this armor bearer, to this man of love, this man of love and prayer, because a man of love and prayer, oh my goodness, a person of love and prayer, oh my goodness, said, come on up. And we will, sh- we will show you something. The, the, the Hebrew there is, we'll teach you something. Come on up, we'll teach you something. <laughs> and Jonathan, they were mocking, obviously, these two. They were mocking him, this man of love and prayer. They were mocking him. Come on up. Uh, so, so Jonathan tells his armor bearer, he said, come on up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into our hands. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees. Climbed up on his hands and knees. <laughs> with his armor bearer after him, and, and so that they all fell before the garrison, fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer came back after following him and killed them. And the slaughter which Jonathan and the armor bearer made was, was uh, 20 men within a half an acre. Look at this, verse 15. And there was great trembling in the camp. So it went beyond now the garrison, and, and, and all of a sudden there was a ripple effect. Everybody say ripple effect. Come on, your prayers will cause a ripple effect. Your prayers will cause a ripple effect. Your prayers will cause a ripple effect. And the garrison, and it says here, in the garrison, the raiders, they all begin to tremble. And the earth began to quake. So now all of a sudden, it's not just the people of the enemy, but now the physical earth is shaking too. And now the watchmen, the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah, Benjamin, looked there, and there, there was a multitude melting away, so they're all running. <laughs> He's like, oh my goodness, our enemy is running. They could see all the dust, and see all the people running. 
And they're like, our enemy is running. And Saul said to the people that went with him, now call, call Roll and find out who's, who's left. And they called Roll. And surprisingly enough, they found out that Jonathan and his armor bearer were gone. And so Saul says to Abijah, bring the ark of God here. For at the time the ark of God was with the children of Israel, verse 19, now it happened while Saul talked to the priests and the noise which was in the camp, the Philistines continued to increase. So Saul said to the priests, withdraw your hand. And Saul and all the people who were with Saul assembled and they went into battle. So now there's a ripple effect. Come on, everybody say ripple effect. So there's a ripple effect because one man of love and prayer, all of a sudden there's a ripple effect. Now there's a whole bunch of people joining Saul, joining him in battle. And they start chasing the enemy. In the verse 21, it says, Moreover, the Hebrews who were with the Philistines. Wait a second. There was Hebrews with the Philistines. What are they doing? Well, they, they, they betrayed. <laughs> Before that time, they, they went up. And so all of a sudden, they go into battle. And they join, they join Saul and the Israelites. And they join Jonathan. And then verse 22, Likewise, all the men of Israel who were hiding in holes and hiding in the mountains. They joined the battle. Everybody say ripple effect. There was a massive ripple effect because one man of love and prayer all of a sudden starts stepping out in boldness because of being stepping into that place with God and knowing what was going on. And, and God was saying, it's time for battle. And Jonathan and the armor bearer heard it. Oh, it's time for battle. So they slipped out. Nobody even noticed. Now, wait a second. Nobody even noticed because there was a, the, the, God's people. There were God's people, but they were a worldly bunch. They weren't walking in the Spirit. And so they had no clue what was going on, but they had a representation of prayer because they had the prayer ephod, they had the ark, they had all the Christian stuff. But there was no power. Paul talks about it in 2 Timothy 3, 5. There's a form of prayer and godliness, but no power. <laughs> but Jonathan noticed that it was a time and a season for war, and he saw the enemy and the enemy encroaching, and so he says, hey, so it's thousands and thousands of them, but hey, the Lord can save by many or he can save by few. So many times we look at, well, you know, there's just a handful of us. Better be careful. Better be careful. Because the sign of God is this. The sign of God is this. You'll get power when you understand that you're facing the impossible. Uh -huh. Don't expect to have power if you're not going to face anything impossible. What do you need power for if you're not going to go to battle? <laughs> <laughs> Be because God is a good steward of his power. And so he's not going to just give power to people that aren't going to go to battle. Because he, he's a good steward. That's why he asked you to be a good steward. Because he is. <laughs> okay, so this is really fun. Okay, so 600 men. So, so Saul represents a, a people of God. Okay, they're a people of God and we love them. We love these people of God. We love these people of God. And so these people of God, they, they, but they, they, they had a form of godliness, but no power. We don't judge them. We don't condemn them. We love them. But they just don't know what's going on. Right? And how do we know that this is what God is saying? Because there were 600 of them. Six represents the number of man. It represents the number of the world. Okay? Are you, are you following me? Okay. Then this gets really wild and fun. So in verses 4 and 5, it talks about these sharp rocks of Bozes and Gibeah. What? Bozes and Gibeah. Well, it's very interesting. Bozes means shiny. Gibeah means thorns. Mikmash means hidden. And Gibeah means hill. Uh, whoops. What did I, what I do? Oh, Senna. Sorry. Sorry. Senna means thorns. Sorry. Bozaz means shiny. Sinna means thorns. Mikmash means hidden. Gibeah means hill. Where Jonathan was going, he was going between the place of shiny thorns and a hidden hill. Now we just read in Psalm 24 what that hidden hill is. 
Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? God had hidden in a mystery in this example of prayer the hidden hill of the Lord. You say, well, what's this shiny thorns? I understand, okay, I'm going to ascend the, the holy hill, the hidden hill, because it's, it's not for everybody. Not everybody can see it, that place of ascension. Not everybody can see it. Not everybody can see that hill, the hill of the Lord. But what's this shiny thorn saying? Shiny, shiny. Well, Jesus, well, oh, Jesus wore a crown of thorns. A shiny crown. Then when I step out, prayer. When I step out in prayer, God puts on my head a shiny crown. But it's not a crown of the world. It's not a worldly crown. It's the crown that Jesus wore that turned the whole world upside down. When he put on that shiny crown and ascended that hidden hill, Jonathan said, Yo, armor bearer, if they come down or if we go up, it don't matter. For the enemy, we're throwing them down. Because the sign for them was the fact that what they were facing was bigger than themselves. And I love this. Then they started climbing up those rocks as the enemy was mocking them oh look at the Hebrews they're coming out of their holes how cute we're going to teach them something and they're climbing up and Jonathan's thinking oh boy yep something going to be taught today and they climb up you know God's army is destined designed to advance on its knees Verses 15 and 16, one man's obedience and prayer brought a great shaking and crumbling of the evil rulership. Quit complaining about evil rulership, start praying. Quit complaining, start praying. And then finally, we looked at it and it's so much fun. Because of a man of love and prayer, because of a man of love and prayer and his obedience. All the Christians that were with Saul, the worldly Christians, came into battle. All the Christians that were with the enemy, that's the backslidden, the prodigals that are in the world, they came into battle. All the timid, fearful Christians that were hiding in the mountains, in the holes, they came into battle. As a man or woman of love who prays, we never disqualify anyone from the battle. Please hear me. Please hear me. As a man and a woman of prayer, come on. As a man or woman of prayer, we never disqualify anyone from joining the battle. I don't care. God doesn't care where you're at right now today in life. What a screw up you are. He doesn't care. He says, I don't, I don't care. Join the battle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to get yourself all cleaned up. He'll, he'll do a good job of that. 
he does a real good job of cleaning us up. He gets right behind the ears and everything. Never disqualify anybody. But rather, we simply celebrate each person for coming home and coming into the battle. There's a couple other scriptures in there in your notes. Talking about calling to battle. It's really fun stuff. If you'd stand, please, in the presence of the Lord. Those of you that are online that are watching, I want you to hear the call to battle and hear the call to prayer. Because like Jonathan heard, others didn't hear. Others didn't hear. But Jonathan heard. The man of love heard. This is a time for battle. Saul and his bunch, they were just sitting around, not knowing what to do, afraid. But Jonathan heard. Let's go to battle. Let's go to battle, family. You were designed for it. You were created for it. God's given you a warrior heart and a warrior spirit. You'll be happy. You'll be happy when you go to battle. When you do it God's way, when you do it His way, It'll bring joy and fulfillment to your heart. Because you were created. You were created to pull down, to throw down, to uproot, to plant. You were created. You were created for it. Father, thank you for this precious time. Help us to treasure these words. Make them come so strong and so true into our heart. Make them become a part of who we are. Let the very, your word, let it become our very nature. Let your word become our nature. We thank you, Father. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Let the Lord stir you. Let the Lord stir you. Don't be afraid to step into that place. Don't be afraid to step into that place of prayer. Thank you, Jesus. And the Lord good? Come on, let's give him praise in this house. This is his house. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You you say, well, I don't understand everything that was happening in there. Remember, the armor bearer, he said to Jonathan, do what is in your heart. That's we were just experiencing it, something that was in someone's heart. Learn to follow that. Learn to follow that. Learn to follow that. Whether it's in prayer, whether it's in obedience, learn to follow what God has put in your heart. Amen? Amen. Well, listen, speaking of prayer, we have a wonderful prayer warriors and prayer ministry team, and they would love to pray with you. I mean, we're not going to preach on prayer and then not have some prayer. So, 
Whatever it is that you want to partner with them in prayer, come on. we got these awesome warriors here. They'd love to pray with you. Whatever the prayer need may be, or if there's something you want to just have them agree with you in prayer, let's do it. Amen. As we're approaching the elections, it's time to do some pulling down, some throwing down, right? Some righteous leadership be established. Amen. Will you promise me that you'll be praying? How how many are you going to be praying the next couple weeks? Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. We'll go in the blessing of the Lord. We love you. Wasn't today beautiful? Come on, one more time for the Lord. Mm. We love you very much. Awesome. Make sure you receive some prayer. Make sure you hug someone before you go today. Have a blessed, blessed day. We love you. We'll see you on Thursday. Celebrate recovery. See you Thursday night, 6.30. See you Saturday night, 6 p.m. See you next Sunday. God bless.